Hoop Heads Podcast is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Hello, Hoop Heads. This is Alan Stein Jr. My new book, Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best, will be available from all major book retailers on January 8th. Raise Your Game takes a rare peek behind the curtain and shows you what the top coaches and players in the game do during the unseen hours. I share their routines, rituals, and habits, as well as proven strategies that you can implement with your team immediately. If you want to maximize your coaching impact and influence, order your copy today at RaiseYourGameBook.com. And in the spirit of the holidays, if you're interested in purchasing multiple copies for your coaching staff, team, or program, I am offering several bonuses, like a 40% discount, signed copies, and a private video call with your team. But you'll have to place your order before Christmas. Once again, go to RaiseYourGameBook.com for everything you need. We're definitely a basketball company. We're definitely a technology company. You know, I think the one thing is, is we, we don't really consider ourselves and we don't want to consider ourselves just a shooting machine company. And I think that's kind of the, just that kind of the status quo out there is, oh, you sell shooting machines. It's like, well, you know, yes, we do. But we're, you know, I mean, a lot of our office and even on the tech side, it's funny, we have at least a few engineers that have, you know, certainly a sports background and are huge basketball fans, which I think is rare to find. And I think we're, we kind of hit the jackpot there. But we, uh, we definitely pride ourselves on what we're going to share is going to be, you know, first class stuff. And what we are going to create from a technology standpoint is going to be first class too. Nick Bartlett is the marketing manager for Dr. Dish Basketball. Nick was born and raised near Minneapolis, Minnesota and played high school basketball at Mounds View High School for now retired coach Ziggy Calls, who was fourth all time in Minnesota wins history with 739 victories. Nick graduated from business school in 2012 from Wisconsin-Eau Claire after playing four years as a combo guard in the Wisconsin Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, one of the top D3 conferences in the country. He was named to the all-sportsmanship team his senior year. Nick went on to grad school at Minnesota State University Mankato for sport management. While he was there, he coached high school girls basketball his first year and was a grad assistant for the MSU Mavericks team his second year, where the team went 30-5. and After grad school, Nick interned with the Philadelphia 76ers as a basketball operations intern in the summer of 2014. Trust the process. After that, he did a year-long basketball operations internship with the Portland Trailblazers during the 2014-15 season. Nick is now the marketing manager for Dr. Dish Basketball back in the Minneapolis area where he grew up. He's been with Dr. Dish for just over three years now and loves growing the brand while remaining in basketball. His day-to-day duties include managing the Dr. Dish website, content, social media, email, partnerships, as well as attending events and clinics. Are you looking for a last-minute gift for Jason and me? How about subscribing to the Hoopheads podcast and leaving us a five-star rating and review wherever you listen? That's the cheapest gift you'll be getting anyone this Christmas. Please take some notes as you enjoy this episode of the Hoopheads podcast with Nick Bartlett from Dr. Dish Basketball, home of the world's best shooting machine. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. Tonight we are pleased to welcome Nick Bartlett, Marketing Manager for Dr. Dish to the podcast. Nick, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me guys. Yeah, we're excited to have you on, talk a little bit about what you're doing now with Dr. Dish, get a little bit of history uh, about how things have gone in your career to this point and give you a chance to talk about all the great things that you have going at Dr. Dish. But let's start out by jumping back in time to when you were a kid and how you got involved in the game of basketball from a young age. Sure thing. Yeah, no, I was really fortunate to have a uh, dad that played um, a little small college basketball here in Minnesota. Uh, and that's where I ended up uh, growing up. And I also was fortunate to have an older brother, too, that was uh, pretty into basketball as well. So uh, as far as, you know, back as I can remember, I watch, remember watching him, you know, play traveling basketball and, um, you know, hoping to be kind of like him and some of his teammates that were really talented. So around the game, you know, very early there and, um, you know, just developed a, a really a love for the game. And so was, you know, fortunate to play uh, for kind of one a legendary high school coach here in Minnesota, uh, Ziggy Calls at Moundsview High School. Uh, I think I just looked up, he is fourth all-time in 
high school basketball wins here in Minnesota. At, I want to say it's like 732 wins. So, um, you know, I was really fortunate to, you know, to learn the, the game from him. And then, um, yeah, was, was able then to, to go on and play uh, college basketball at uh, Uni- University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire um, in the WIAC, which I take a lot of pride in, um, in that. You know, it's one of the best Division III um, conferences in the in the nation. So got to play um, against some really good competition. So I was really fortunate um, to, um, you know, play at that level. And um, after that, yeah, I was able to – um, go to grad school um, at Minnesota State Mankato, which is you know one of the top D two programs in the nation. And uh, first year there, I was uh, actually able to coach high school girls basketball, uh, which was a you know very interesting experience and um, loved it there. And uh, the second year there, I was able to be a grad assistant for the um, Minnesota State Mavericks basketball team. So. Um, that year we went 30 and five, which was which was great. Um, un- unfortunately, got upset in the tournament, but um, was able to learn a ton from uh, great coaching staff there that has done just a tremendous job building that program. Um, and then, yeah, I guess after that, was able to spend some time as a as an intern in the NBA, um, which was kind of a dream of mine to to work at the highest level of basketball and. So I was with the uh, 76ers in the summer of 2014. Uh, that's when we actually drafted um, Joel Embiid as well as Dario Saric. And we had a whole slew of second-round picks. Hashtag trust the process. <laughs> uh, and then after that summer, I was able to go to uh, Portland where uh, I was a basketball operations intern for a full year there, the 14-15 season. Um, which again, it was was awesome. Just learning from you know Coach Terry Stotts there, who's done a tremendous job and just a very knowledgeable coach. Um, and then yeah, after that, kind of transitioned right into uh, coming back home into to Minneapolis and working for just a great company here, uh, Doctor Dish Basketball. All right, so I want to break down each one of those steps a little bit further, uh, if you don't mind. I want to go back to first of all when you were a young kid and ask you this question because I think it's one that I find to be interesting and that is did you find that having a an older brother and being the younger brother and trying to keep up with them do you think that that aided in your development as a player oh absolutely yeah and you know we we had a good I think I would call it a friendly rivalry between the the two of us I mean he was you know always uh, obviously bigger than me but he was even just big for for his grade too so um, I was able to, I think, really boost my toughness um, just playing against him. And, um, you know, I was able to kind of step in and, you know, even fill in in some of uh, his practices, even though I was, you know, a good four, three or four years, you know, younger than him. Um, but I, I just, you know, I loved, uh, you know, being able to just be around the, the team. I think that really developed uh, my love for the game. And, you know, my, you know, eyes were always, you know, just big and bright every time the you know, I got a chance to get on the court, whether it was with him or with his team. And, um, you know, and I think that really accelerated just my development as a player. Um, so I think that that was definitely uh, very fortunate that I was the, the younger, you know, brother there. And I think I learned a lot from, from him and his friends and his teammates. I always think it would be interesting to do a study. I'm sure there's probably one out there of how many guys that end up having – success at a higher level or women for that matter that have the older siblings uh, just because it always seems to me that you know the younger kids always get you know are, are beaten up on the, the older ones are beating up on the younger ones who pushing them and to your point making them more competitive because you're trying to keep up and I think that'd be an interesting longitudinal study to go out and find out where you know where people fall on the success spectrum depending on where they are in the birth order right no absolutely I uh, yeah, I, I feel like I I was on the the right end of that stick for sure. Yeah, I, I was on the other end. I was an older sibling, but I only had a, I only had a sister, so I had to look to my neighborhood for the older guys that used to beat me up on the basketball court and the football field and everything else. So I can I can relate to it, just not within the family. It was more in the neighborhood situation. So uh, then you move on. So then you move on to high school, and you get an opportunity to play for a Hall of Fame coach. What do you remember the most about playing for him in terms of things that you learned about the game just in terms of whether it was something actually basketball or something maybe just in terms of the relationships that he built with players or what is it that you remember about your time in high school 
Yeah, no, I mean, again, very fortunate to, to play for Coach Calls there. And, yeah, I definitely learned a lot of things on the court, certainly. A lot of really little things that I just didn't realize, um, you know, even just how to get open. And, you know, and I played a lot of point guard myself, too. And, uh, I, you know, credit him, you know, with teaching me just really little things like, um, you know, I guess playing with pace, um, and, and things like that that I didn't know at the time um, were was you know all that important until uh, later on you know I'd watch a game and I'd hear a commentator say something and say oh that sounds like something you know Coach Calls would have said so a lot of just really um, intricate things to the game I mean obviously he'd been around for so long I he coached for I want to say forty five years and I think I got him kind of towards the end there where it was about forty to you know forty two years or so when I was. Uh, playing for him so um, just you know learned it learned a ton and then even just um, you know off the court or uh, just his commitment to the game uh, overall uh, was fantastic so we had a lot of open gyms and kind of the, the mounds view open gyms where I'm from were, were kind of legendary in a way and we'd get attract a lot of people just from the Minneapolis metro area to come to our open gyms and I never really understood why I just figured you know oh we got a good tradition but it was mainly because, uh, you know, Coach Calls was always there. And even though he was probably, I don't know, in his 70s or so, I mean, he came uh, just about every every open gym was always there. It was, uh, you know, kind of a given, kind of a joke that uh, ran through, you know, our program and all the players. But he uh, was just so committed, and he, he loved it. He loved sharing stories of guys from literally 40 years ago <laughs> and how they, how they used to do – you know things and stuff and, and it was funny we you know we we made a lot of fun of of it at the time but it's uh you know it's just crazy the the experiences you know he won two state championships coached um i want to say two or three i think it was three mr basketballs in minnesota um you know went to multiple i want to say 14 15 16 state tournaments uh so i think just learning the stories and i, I you know and, and just how much he cared um, and how much he remembered, you know, I, I'd like to think, you know, he, he goes back to those open gyms, which I'm pretty sure he does even to this day. I'd like to think he talks about, you know, me and, and some of my teammates as well. But, uh, you know, just a, just a tremendous uh, person, tremendous coach. And, um, again, I'm, I'm just really fortunate that I, I was able to catch just the tail end of his uh, legacy there. Yeah, there's two things that stand out from what you said. One is just how fortunate you are to be able to have played for that – type of coach because not every kid gets to play for that type of coach that has the commitment and the you know the experience and just the knowledge of the game that you were fortunate enough to have with coach calls and so that's one thing because again I think a lot of kids you know you hope that when you get to high school that you're going to have a coach that does all those things that you described but we all know that that isn't always the case so uh, for those kids and yourself that you get that opportunity I think that's tremendous and then the second thing is, is I think when you have somebody that's gone for that long, to me, I'm always amazed at the people. It seems like once you get beyond that, you know, 25 or 30 year mark that guys are coaching, the people that get into those, you know, the 30s, the 40 year coaches are just guys that just, they're just incredible from a, what they remember standpoint, from a, an enthusiasm standpoint from a commitment standpoint they're just very very unusual people forget about coaches but just to be able to go at it that long and to maintain your enthusiasm and excitement for the game i think is just a credit to what you know he was able to accomplish over the course of his career absolutely and i think that's why he he was so successful as you know and you you take all the things that he knew on the court, which is fantastic. But I think we we all went to battle for him because we we knew how much he cared. We you know really wanted to um, you know give it all just you know just for him you know and, and play play hard for him. So I think um, you know yeah again I, I, at the time I kind of took it for granted. I just figured you know this is just what high school basketball is. But I think looking back and talking with kids now and talking with you know coaches and stuff, I you know I really realize now. Um, you know how how big you know again i don't think i realized how much of an impact he had on me then uh because i just you know that was the only thing i really knew and, and now looking back i i realized i was yeah very fortunate and um you know as much as you know i can think about all the things on the court that he did um to you know enhance my game you know i 
to this day, I still think about um, the stories. I think about how much you know he cared, and um, even though that was you know a, a good decade ago, I mean he, he genuinely made you know a really big impact on on my life just in general. Yeah, it's amazing the impact that again a good coach can have on a kid, and just make make you want to love the game even more than you do and teach it in the right way. And like you said, a lot of kids don't always get those experiences. And so to be able to have that experience, even though to your point, uh, you didn't know necessarily that anybody did have a different when you're a kid, you kind of are stuck in your own world. And I know I can speak to myself on that. You know, you kind of go through a high school program or you go through a college program and you kind of think that, Hey, this is the way it is everywhere. And then you have conversations with other people and you realize like, Oh, it's not like that everywhere. And that could be in a good or bad way, but everybody kind of has this unique experience. So while you were there playing in high school, did you always have the goal, the dream of playing college basketball and then talk a little bit about the process, uh, how you ended up at Eau Claire? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, yeah, I, I just knew, I wanted to play basketball pretty much as long as I possibly could. So um, definitely college basketball was a, um, you know, a, a big goal of mine. And I, I wanted to play at, yeah, definitely the highest level that I could. Um, and, you know, that just turned out to be, you know, Division three in, in, in Wisconsin. Um, you know, they, they were able to kind of recruit me early at Eau Claire, and I was kind of grateful for that. So Eau Claire is about an hour and a half away from uh, Minneapolis, where I'm from. So, um it's, uh, it was nice. It was close by, so my parents could come to you know virtually every game, and um, you know, in, in again, in a really good conference there in the the WIAC. Um, so yeah, I, I'm really fortunate to um, to play at a high level. Um, again, I you know I didn't realize how you know how high the level would be at, at the Division three level, but. Um, the interesting thing about Wisconsin is, you know, there's a handful of Division One schools. You got your Marquette, uh, Wisconsin, Green Bay, and Milwaukee. I want to say are the four Division Ones, but there's only one Division Two school in the entire state, which is UW Parkside. And other than that, it's it's just a bunch of D three schools. So if you're not quite at that Division One level and you want to stay, you know, in state, um, you're, you're likely going to be playing uh, in the WIAC at that. Division three level, so um, definitely felt like um, we, you know, we had a lot of players in our conference that were, you know, certainly um, worthy of you know those scholarships, but um, um, they just ended up, you know, staying uh, local and, and you know playing in that in that Division three conference. So uh, again, really fortunate to to get a chance to play for four years there. Yeah, and it's a little bit different, you know, where we are in Ohio or up in the Northeast. You have, you know, people here think of a Division three college as being a small, private, you know, a lot of times liberal liberal arts college. But in Wisconsin, you're talking about big public universities that have a large enrollment. So it's a little bit different than some other places in the country in terms of, you know, the Division three. And I think that probably contributes to the level of play that's present there as compared to maybe some other places in the country. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a good point because, yeah, even though it was Division three, I mean, uh, Eau Claire, I think we, we had ten or 15,000 kids that – you know, attended our um, our college. I think that was pretty standard across the across the board there. So yeah, it, w- it was just cool because um, you know you would look at all of our non conference schedule as a as a whole as a conference, and um, I mean we'd be you know seventy five or eighty you know percent you know win winning percentage there, and um, and then you know once you got into conference, it didn't matter if the you know if you were first or, or last. I mean you knew if especially if you're going on the road there, you're you're in for a battle. So I think it, it definitely um, made me realize you know how you know just the, the importance of preparation throughout the year. And I want to say you know as an undergrad there, freshman sophomore, um, I'd be lying if I didn't say I, I was kind of burned out towards the end of the year because it, it's a you know it is an absolute grind and. Um, it's really, really hard to win on the road there. I mean, I'd, I'd rather, I don't know, not look up my road record while I was, <laughs> while I was at Eau Claire because uh, we didn't win a whole lot of games there. But, um, again, I, I still take a lot of pride. And, um, you know, and just, again, I feel uh, blessed that I was able to have the, that opportunity to, to play for four years in college. And, again, some of the, uh, you know, my best friends today are, are guys that I met on that team. And, um, you know, we, we had some great times. So, so you said it was a grind. What's your craziest road story while playing in the in the WIAC conference? 
Yeah, so, I mean, I guess other than the, you know, the, the road trips that we would have in, you know, it's Wisconsin, so, I mean, sometimes there's, you know, two, three feet of snow that we're, we're going through. I, you know, I, I definitely did not envy the, uh, the bus drivers that uh, had to navigate around that. So, I know we went up to the, the um, UP, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, one year, and, and our, and our uh, bus broke down, and so that was a whole ordeal but um I, i'll never forget my freshman year I, I didn't play a ton my freshman year i want to say i played about 10 minutes a game or so but we went to stevens point so uw stevens point which is a really really good program i mean they have to be top 10 program in the nation and um so we went on the road there i hadn't been playing a ton but for whatever reason i got a, a lot of opportunity uh to get in there and uh, for whatever reason, I was guarding the the best player um, on their team, and a great shooter. Um, and he was a senior; I was a freshman, and uh, I just couldn't believe how rabid the fans were. And basically, the coach said, "Hey, you just stick to this guy like glue, and you play you know you play as hard as you possibly can." And so you know, I had my adrenaline going, and I, I'll just never forget you know the the crowd just you know screaming, "Number twelve! Number twelve is a hack!" And, <laughs> <laughs> worst and um you know i remember taking a charge and you know getting pretty pretty amped up and i mean you got the uh, fans and a lot of these guys you know they're they're towny fans and they're standing right above me and you're nothing special bartlett you're nothing special and um and it, it was it was so much fun for me as a, as a freshman i had never experienced a um an atmosphere like that and um, you know, yeah, unfortunately, we never got a chance to beat Stevens Point at Stevens Point because that place is insane, and they had a really good program. But my very last game of my career, uh, we did beat Stevens Point. I think it, I guess it would have been like one and seven against them. Uh, but that very last game we won. It was at home, but uh, it was that was the only team in the conference I hadn't beaten. So um, really. <laughs> really thankful that that happened that was a nice way to top that was a nice way to top it off can you talk a little bit about just how good division three basketball is because i know one of the things that always there's i think a misperception out there especially among high school kids when the recruiting process kind of starts and everybody obviously has their eye on a division one scholarship or division two scholarship and they kind of look down a little bit at Division Three as they're coming through the recruiting process, at least kids who don't really know what that process is or parents and coaches that don't really understand the process. So can you talk a little bit about just the level of play at Division Three from your perspective and what just, I mean, you've already explained some of the great experiences that you've had, but just why Division Three basketball is as good as it is. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I know I was kind of one of them when I was in high school. You know, I was one of the better players certainly in, in uh, on my team in the conference and so so i'm thinking you know with my talent level i you know i got to be a scholarship player and um for one i think you just have to understand how you know good you have to be just to be you know a scholarship level player at, at uh you know at any level and the, the work that you have to put in and um you know how dedicated you you, you have to be and um, I certainly didn't understand that, and um, again, I still feel fortunate. Though once I got to, um, you know, Claire, a, a great Division three college, um, I'm still fortunate that I was able to play there. Um, again, I think that the talent level, the I should say, the skill level, is really very comparable across, you know, Division two, Division, you know, three, Division one. Um, a lot of it just comes down to, um, you know, athletic ability. I think in a lot of cases. Uh, but we had a lot of, you know, even Division One transfers that would, you know, um, go small D1, it wouldn't really work out there. And they, they transfer to a, a school in the WIAC at, at Division Three. So, um, you know, I, I know I played certainly against um, a lot of Division One players that were very skilled. I think really what set them apart was just their athletic ability, their, their quickness, their, um, you know, vertical jump, you know, just how tall, big, and strong they were. But, um, again, though, I mean, I, some of the – you know, best shooters I've ever played against were Division three guys, not necessarily Division one guys. It was just, um, you know, they, they were a little step slow, uh, kind of like myself, um, or or they, you know, they were 5'10", um, so it was, you know, difficult for them to, you know, to play at, at a real high level. But uh, I think the skill level was, was fantastic. Um, and, and, yeah, I mean, 
I think overall, just to play college basketball really at, at any level um, is, I think, is just a really special thing. And, um, you know, I know for me, you know, looking back, sure, I could have worked harder. I could have worked um, a little bit more, you know, purposefully. But um, I, I know I, I still, I spent a lot of time in the gym and, um, you know, had a decent amount of gifts. And uh, for me, you know, to, to play at the Division three level, um, you know, I, I, I'll never really regret that. Yeah, I think a lot of times you're right that the physical tools that a player has sometimes allow them to play at a higher level than another player that maybe just doesn't have the same physical tools, whether, as you said, your size, quickness, jumping ability, whatever it might be. And to your point, I think that you know if you go and watch a Division three college basketball game as a high school player, you're going to see the skill, uh, you know, the skill level of the players and the quality of play that again, the high school players are just not used to that level of play. So I think it's something that, you know, we've, we've tried to on some of our other podcasts with, with coaches is really get, you know, really get that out there that, you know, if you're getting an opportunity to play college basketball, no matter what the level is, that you want to keep that ball bouncing for yourself as long as you can if you love the game. And so, you know, it's important not to close the door on any opportunity that you might have. Because to your point, you obviously went to Eau Claire and had a great experience, and it's something that, you know, you've had friendships that you've built up from being on the team, and it's something that you wouldn't trade for the world. And I think most people, if you end up going to the right place for you, that ends up being the situation. So I'm glad that that worked out for you. I had a similar experience when I went and had an opportunity to play at Kent State, and it turned out to be a great opportunity for me and uh, and ended up being able to have a great career and probably probably outplayed my lack of athleticism, as Jason likes to call me, sneaky athletic, which I don't know that that was ever the case. But uh, at any rate, you know, it's great to hear you talking about Division Three and how good your experience was. Uh, so you graduate. And now you move on and you're at Minnesota State and you get an opportunity to coach for the first time and you end up coaching on the girls' side. So can you talk a little bit about, one, to, first of all, just what it was like to move from playing to coaching and what that adjustment was like and then how you found it to be coaching the girls' team, uh, which I don't know if you had any experience doing that at, at any point you know, when you were younger, but just talk a little bit about those two things, your adjustment to coaching from playing and then what it was like coaching that girls' team for the first time. Yeah, that was um, just an incredible experience, I think. Uh, overall, I, I look back and I'm laughing because I thought it was going to be such a seamless transition from – you know, I, I just got done playing. You know, I have all this knowledge. I know everything about basketball. Um, I'm going to bring this in and, and teach the, you know, these girls um, exactly what I learned. And um, I couldn't have been, you know, more clueless. I feel like at that time, it, it was, it was just funny going into that first practice and having this practice plan. Of, you know, basically trying to kind of mimic what we were doing at Eau Claire and that was just the absolute wrong um, <laughs> I, can only I can only imagine what that looked like Nick it, 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 exactly I'm, I'm hoping that um, yeah coaches are, are you know around the country right now are laughing at me because it, it was pretty funny so I, um, you know I definitely had to it definitely humbled myself and realized okay first off I, I really don't know um, everything about basketball and number two let's uh, let's you know Let's go one step at a time here. Uh, we're not going to win um, any national championships here at Mankato West High School, um, and and so that that transition was was really um, was really fun. And I think the, the the girls that I had, I mean, thankfully they were it was a good group of girls overall, and they were um, they were patient with me as I had to be patient with them too. Um, but I think yeah, it was just really breaking down the game and. Um, you know, really focusing on the fundamentals and, um, and, and, and again, just really focusing on fun as well. I mean, I was just so used to playing at this, this high level um, that it was, you know, you had these detailed practice plans and you, you had to, um, you know, just get as much work done as possible and um, within a, you know, limited amount of time. And I think with the, you know, with those girls, you know, it was, it was technically, it was the B, uh, I guess the C squad. So we had the, um, varsity JV and I was coaching the, the C squad there and, and also helping out a little bit with the, the varsity as an assistant. But, um, yeah, I think just, you know, focusing on, on fun fundamentals, um, you know, just passing, catching, 
um, you know, basic shell defense and, you know, help side and stuff like that. So um, that was uh, kind of somewhat of a rude awakening. But I, by the, the end of the year, though, I, I mean, and I'm sure a lot of coaches can relate, it was so fun to see um, how much they had progressed. And, um, you know, just the, the day by day, um, you could almost see that improvement. And um, now you're, you know, beating teams at the end of the year that you were losing to at the beginning of the year. And, um, you, you know, a lot of those play, um, you know, I would say a handful of the players that I had um, had, you know, varsity aspirations. So I think really pushing them um, to be better and to really understand what it would take to, to play at that varsity level um, was really fun. So, um, again, I – it's just funny. I going into that, I you know, I thought, hey, let's let's we're, we're going to go for an undefeated season here. This is going to kickstart my, you know, glorious uh, coaching career, and uh, I was humbled pretty quickly. Yeah, I think you find out one of the things that I know. We've heard from a bunch of different coaches, and I can vouch for this on my own self, is that you know when you first come out after you get done playing, and you think, boy, I know everything, and I'm ready to be a great coach. And you realize that coaching and playing are two completely different animals altogether. And so you really have to, like you said, be humbled and really get yourself into the weeds of, you know, of coaching before you can figure out exactly what it is that you know, that you don't know, what you need to know. And I, I found that, you know, again, when I was 23, I thought I knew everything. And now that I'm 48, I find that I don't know very much at all. And so I've become much more of a learner at this point in my life than I was probably when I was 23 and it certainly should have been reversed if nothing else so uh, I think your experience that you had was very similar to what a lot of players go through when they're transitioning into coaching because again it just takes it just takes some time to understand that playing and coaching are two different entities for sure right and I wish I would have um, found that out while I was playing at some point or had some sort of because because then looking back, you know, and then I was really appreciative of, you know, my high school coach and my college coaches. And it was pretty funny. I remember um, after one practice that, you know, just did not go very well. I remember calling my um, coach, Coach Kyle Green, uh, who was uh, my coach, just my senior year at Eau Claire. And I called him and I said, Coach, I I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. And I can't, I can't believe, you know, how hard this is. And, you know, he's laughing and stuff but um you know i wish i would have known that and uh, you know i hope i hope maybe some players are listening to this because also it's it's funny when you hear parents or uh, fans of the game or former players you know criticize coaches um you know at the youth level at the high school level you know obviously at the college and pro level it's just so easy to point out like you know i can't believe um they, they would coach like this or they would run that play or why wouldn't they do this and um, I tell you, you know, and I used to do it plenty before I started coaching. And then when I coached, I was like, man, I really hope people aren't watching my games very closely because <laughs> there's there's a lot that they could be criticizing, a lot of things that I'm doing. So it, it, it's funny, um, you know, I think everyone's a genius coach until they're thrown into it and they realize, oh, wow, there's a lot that goes on here, um, you know, from a practice standpoint, game standpoint. So now I, I, I catch myself now when I'm, you know, when I'm criticizing coaches. Um, at any level because I know hey wait a second um, <laughs> you were there once and, and you had no clue what you were doing either yeah I, I, I have to agree with the whole like they're watching you thing because last year was the first year I ever had a, a parent volunteer to tape my games I coach middle school basketball and there are some my, my facial expressions at some points during the game and just like my general reactions I didn't realize that I was doing them until I watched the video and like the, the kids would point out oh yeah you always do that and I'm like oh man I really need to correct that because it's not really appropriate so I, I totally I totally fess up to that <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure I had, I had plenty of those myself. Absolutely. Let's sum it up by saying coaching is hard. Agreed. Let's take a quick break and hear from our sponsor, Alan Stein Jr. Hello, hoop heads. This is Alan Stein Jr. My new book, Raise Your Game: High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best, will be available from all major book retailers on January 8th. Raise Your Game takes a rare peek behind the curtain and shows you what the top coaches and players in the game do during the unseen hours. I share their routines, rituals, and habits, as well as proven strategies that you can implement with your team immediately. If you want to maximize your coaching impact and influence, 
Order your copy today at raiseyourgamebook.com. All right, so then you, uh, after that, you move on. Uh, you're a grad assistant for a year, and then you go on to the NBA. So let's get to that point and talk a little bit about your time with the Sixers and what that was like and exactly what your responsibilities were there and what you what you remember from your time with Philadelphia, maybe a memorable story or an opportunity that you had to interact with the players or with Sam Hankey or somebody that was there, you know, as part of the process. Yeah, um, that was, I mean, three months um, of my life that I think were, you know, some of the craziest but fun three months. Um, you know, I knew going into it, it was you know, pretty much just going to be a summer internship. I was kind of just thrown in there and, you know, just to be, um, help out wherever was possible. So it was a lot of um, just picking up players at, from the airport. So we had, at that that year, we had two first-round picks, the number three and the number 10, and we had five second-round picks. And so um, leading up to the draft, I mean, pretty much from, you know, May 25th to, you know, June 25th or whenever the draft was, I mean, we just had tons of workouts um, and a lot of second, you know, second-round pick-type um, guys were in there. And uh, so I'm picking up a lot of these guys at the airport. You were Uber uh, driver, essentially. Yeah, that's basically what I was. And uh, but it was it was an absolute blast just getting to know a lot of the guys, um, you know, one on one. I mean, for the most part, you know, I was thinking, you know, a lot of these guys are going to be prima donnas or going to be really rude and um, stuff. But I, I don't think, yeah, that could have been further from the truth. I mean, everybody, you know, for the most part, really uh, handled themselves really well. It was just real fun just to get to know them. And a lot of these guys, I was, you know. I remember watching you play um, this past year in college or the past few years in college. Um, and, and so that was, it was just really fun. Um, and did a lot of other stuff just around the office, um, helping out with, you know, video projects and, um, and whatnot. Got to know Brett Brown, Coach Brett Brown, one of the nicest guys, you know, I've ever met. Got to know him real well and just do some kind of random projects for him. Uh, I guess the, the, the best story that I have is, is, is funny, and I pretty much tell everyone is that, um, I don't know what exactly happened or how it happened, but um, we drafted Joel Embiid, and he, he was getting uh, flown into Philadelphia, and um, they had a, a special, you know, black car or so to pick him up at the airport, but they said, hey, we want someone to, you know, at least be in the car representing, you know, the, the 76ers. Nick, why don't you go? And, you know, I mean, I was, you know, deer in the headlights, like, oh, why, why would you send me? <laughs> And so, you know, and, and obviously now it's pretty well documented how much of a character, um, you know, Joel is. And, um, you know, and, and he was just, he was hilarious, the you know, the first time I met him. And, um, you know, and it was just so, so respectful, but just, you know, so much of a kid at the same time. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget, too, him, you know, talking to, you know, one of our trainers or nutritionists kind of about, um, you know, what, what's your conditioning look like and um you know okay we'll, we'll get you on a really good um you know diet this this summer and, and we'll get you ready to go and get you you know a lot of a lot of vegetables and and uh, you know i i've never seen someone so opposed to eating vegetables uh, before. <laughs> he's like he's like that may be your plan but my plan involves some other foods oh, i was gonna say he probably sounds like he, he probably feels better uh playing in the 70s when they would smoke cigarettes at halftime and uh do those kind of things not not necessarily eating the vegetables right right exactly so he was just he was just such a such a character but such a um a, a great you know, great kid you know really at that time i think he was like 19 or um, or 20 at the oldest or whatever so he uh, so that, that was real fun I'm you know uh, again I just take pride in being the first I guess you know once he became a 76er I was the first representative that that he got to meet um, you know from from the team so that was uh, that, it was just a fun summer overall though that's hilarious that they sent an intern to go meet the prospective you know, number one draft choice. Uh, that's 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 hilarious that you were the guy that got the uh, got the opportunity to sit in the sit in the black car service with uh, with Joel Embiid. Right, and I think yeah, he was there with you know, I don't know if it, it wasn't his official agent, but it was like an assistant, and you know, and I think she she said, oh yeah, so what do you do with the team? And I, you know, I was like, oh, I, I'm just an intern, and she kind of gave me a look like, what the heck? But. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Maybe I, I sh- shouldn't be sharing this with everyone. But uh, 
God, it was it was still fun. I'm still glad they sent me. <laughs> well, you didn't mess it up, man. They get you know they got you got you got Joel drafted, which was uh, obviously the the right pick at the time, and and it, the things have turned out pretty well once he's gotten healthy. Right. Can't complain about that. So after the Sixers, you go and you work with the uh, you work with the Trailblazers. Uh, talk a little bit about that experience and what that was like. I know you mentioned earlier that you know Terry Stotts, obviously a very successful NBA coach out there, and you know they have some really good players that uh, I'm sure you got a chance to meet and interact with on a, you know a little bit. So talk a little bit about your time there with Portland. Yeah, that was uh, again just a, a, a great organization overall. So I spent a, a year there, got to know um, you know the, certainly the front office real well. Got to know some of the players. Um, certainly, it was you know Lamarcus. Uh, Aldrich's. It was his last year there, um, so he, you know, he was great um, to be around. Obviously, Damian Lillard, C.J. McCollum, you know, um, you know, fantastic players, but also just fantastic people. So there, yeah, it was just kind of a lot uh, more of the same in terms of just doing a lot of administrative tasks around the the office. Um, I think my biggest thing there was um, keeping up. We had magnet boards, so like salary magnet boards and. Uh, roster boards like all over the office and that was kind of my baby was just making sure that those were clean um, you know we had the right salaries we had um, you know anytime a trade went down I you know my eyes lit up because I knew I could move all these magnets all around and stuff so uh, <laughs> it's, like a was, it's like a kid with his letters man exactly exactly so that was that you know, magnets was my specialty that year but um, yeah just a just a great organization though overall I got to learn a ton from um, you know the assistant general managers over there um you know bill branch was a fantastic guy um i think pretty much that's that same regime is still there um joe cronin the, the director of player personnel um and then you know just just some of the scouting staff and um you know it's just again so many great stories um shared around there and um yeah just just real fortunate to be at, at you know a part of uh, such a great organization what's something that somebody who's just an average fan who's listening who hasn't been on the inside of an NBA franchise like you've had the opportunity to do in a couple different places what's something that the average person might not know about the inner workings of whether it's the front office the coaching staff just something behind the scenes that the average person might might not know or might take for granted yeah there's a lot I mean I think the the one thing that was really fascinating to me and I kind of took that year to, to learn a lot about was the salary cap and, um, you know, on how, um, you know, difficult it really is, you know, to, to make certain trades based on just the, the, the salary cap. And you have to match the salaries. You got to make sure that, you know, uh, you're not getting a player who is, you know, on a long contract necessarily, um, you know, the, the value of expiring contracts, um, you know, it, it you know, it, it's to me it's just it's crazy honestly how many trades that there are done um in the nba because i think it's 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 really hard to to match that up but um it's you know it's also just um you know i think there's the scouting process too and how much goes into that just even planning the travel behind it uh, making sure that you know each you know player is is seen you know you, you never know whether it's you know it could be a second round pick um that you know that can change your franchise so you got to make sure that you have your due diligence on each one of these players and um you know obviously nobody you know has that magical eye um that, that magical scouting eye but um you, you know you have to make sure that you know three years down the road when they say hey why didn't you draft this guy and you say well I, I didn't i didn't even know anything about him i didn't even know um who he was you know you got you have to make sure so just the you know the, the sheer amount of names that were on the prospect board um, for us was was incredible, and um, you never know who can buy into the second round. So it was, uh, yeah, it was just a crazy process. Um, you know, we actually made a draft day trade that year um, as well. Um, you know, we had the twenty third pick. We ended up trading. Uh, we drafted Rondé Hollis Jefferson, traded him for um, Mason Plumley, and maybe something else. And um, so again, just it, 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 all the different scenarios that that go on there, and um, and then we ended up buying in the second round. So um, yeah, again, the, the average and um, you know NBA fan, which was me beforehand, you know, I'm thinking, you know, this is this is easy, um, you know, you just you you have a draft pick and you you know pick the best player available, and there's just so much more that goes and you know goes into that, and again, too, the, the salary cap is is something that's a whole beast in its own. Yeah. With that being said, I think it's interesting that the you know with as much money 
and personnel and time that's put into scouting that it's still such an inexact science oh, yeah. to, to project how a guy is going to end up performing in the NBA. When you really think about it, you know, you've got this whole body of work and obviously if it's a one and done player, it's, you know, you have a, a little less body of work, but the kid has been playing basketball for 10 years and you've got, you know, so much time is spent pouring over tape and interviews and seeing them in person and watching the film and breaking it down and all that stuff. And yet still there's really, to your point, nobody has that magic eye to say, you know, this guy's for sure going to be play a player at this level. And this guy for sure is going to achieve at this level. And it's just, it's incredible to me that, that you just the projections because again I think it all comes down to you the thing that you can't project is how what the guy's heart is like and how hard he's going to work and if you could if you could predict that I think you'd have a pretty good idea of what level of success guys are going to get to and the reality is is you know you can't you can't know that in advance until you really get the guy in the league and it's his job and it's what he's doing day in day out and I'm sure some guys are willing to grind and do what they need to do to be successful and then there's other guys who to go back to our early discussion, have a lot of tools, but maybe don't always put those tools to the best use. No, absolutely. Um, and, and there's just so many different factors. And for you know every you know rule that you know in quotes rule, there is there's always an exception to. Um, so you know, and there's just you know there's so much you know, ba- just the simple like balance of you know uh, ready now and p- versus potential is uh, is insane. So. Um, it, it's fascinating. I'm still, you know, I'm still going to follow it as, as much as possible, and I'm still going to try to make my bold th- predictions every year, and um, definitely let everyone know about the ones I get right, and we'll, we'll just forget about the ones that I got wrong. Um, but it's, 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 um, yeah, it's just a fascinating business overall, and I'm glad that I got a chance at least to kind of see the inner workings there just a little bit. I, I definitely like making bold predictions, and then only saying the ones that I get right and not saying anything about the ones that I got wrong. Like when I said LeBron was going to the Lakers on a four-year deal, Mike looked at me like I was a crazy man. But we also both thought the Cavs were going to be uh, semi. We thought really they were going to be semi competent this year, but uh, uh, apparently we were wrong on that one. Yeah, so we were we were definitely wrong. We were definitely wrong on that. But uh, you know that's that's the way it goes. But I also said the Rockets weren't going to be a top four seed. So you know every once in a while you throw something lucky out there and it, it becomes at least to this point in the season it becomes true. So who knows? Um, so from there, you from from you from the NBA experience, then you get an opportunity to go and work with Dr. Dish Basketball. Can you talk a little bit about how that opportunity came to you? And then we'll get into what you're doing now and what things Dr. Dish Basketball has going that you know our audience would be interested in finding out about. Yeah, definitely. I it's a that's a funny story in itself too. So I was with the Trailblazers and um, you know, I think in college I, I had this kind of a, a LinkedIn phase where I was kind of just obsessed with LinkedIn and, and optimizing my profile and everything and honestly I kind of forgot about it and I was like well you know that was kind of a waste of time I, I don't I don't think LinkedIn's ever going to lead to an opportunity and and sure enough when I was in Portland um, the CEO you know Doug Campbell over at um, Dr. Dish ended up just sending me an, uh, an email or a LinkedIn message and basically just asked and said you know I see that you're from the Minneapolis area, I see you have basketball background, I see you, you know, you're a marketing major and you have some marketing experience, you know, we're looking for somebody to um, kind of take the reins on our uh, marketing team here, um, you know, would you be interested in learning more? And honestly, I was really close to just deleting that message because I was like, I'm in the NBA, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. And uh, I thought, you know, thought, ah, let's, let's at least, uh, you know, entertain, see what he has to say. So got on the phone with him, it just so happened I was going to be back in Minneapolis in like a week or so, so I thought... Um, you know, let's go ahead and meet up with him. And I guess the rest is history. So, um, you know, was able to get just an opportunity to, to, to come home, stay in basketball, um, do something in marketing, which I was passionate about. So it just was kind of a perfect fit. So, um, you know, I wasn't entirely sure, you know, what it would lead to, but here I am, I guess, just over three years later. And, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of really cool stuff, um, over at Dr. Dish and I mean just a great team so um, honestly when he reached out to I didn't know much about Dr. Dish and I think I'd barely really ever heard of it and I think most people when they think of you know basketball shooting machines you know I used them growing up but I used uh, you know a different company and uh, I think you know probably 
uh, most coaches or so, and they, they know who I'm talking about. And um, and so when I learned a little bit more about Dr. Dish and kind of the, how it was different, um, just from a versatility standpoint, technology standpoint, um, you know, analytics, um, and I could really see that, wow, this is there's some really valuable stuff here. I think more than anything, people just need to know about it, and they need to, um, you know, see it in action. And, um, you know, and so that was kind of my goal then was, you know, when, when I got on board was let's, Let's increase the visibility of this machine. Let's get it out to the out to the masses, and um, and then just you know just kind of run from there. And, and since then we've uh, yeah I mean, we've done some really cool things, and I think we're we're getting you know to the point where we're we're starting to be uh, um, kind of a household name, at least certainly in the basketball industry. So talk a little bit about the machine itself and what makes it unique and what makes it the best shooting machine uh, out there on the market. And then we'll get into, after you talk a little bit about that, we'll talk a little bit about what your role is in terms of getting it out there to the public. So to your point, you can publicize it and market it and get it into the, get it in front of the people that it needs to be in front of so that they can, uh, they can see it and know what it's all about. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think just what we're doing, um, you know, I think the best analogy that I, that I like to use is, um, you know, I think 10 years ago, um, I had a, you know, maybe it was 10 years ago, I had a flip phone and I thought this flip phone was, was awesome. And, um, you know, it, it was really cool. I could call people, I could text people and that was really cool. And then, you know, um, there's a reason now or why everybody has smartphones here today. And I think that's kind of what the, the industry, you know, I think in 10 years ago, if you had, you know, the, the other machine, you know, if you had the gun, you, uh, you know, it was great. You got you got reps up. Um, you know, maybe you would keep track of your stats. Maybe you wouldn't. Um, you know, and, and and that was that was pretty much it. It was really good. And I think what we've done at Doctor Dish has kind of evolved, kind of like a smartphone. When um, just in general, you know, why why do you use a smartphone? It's because it's more user friendly. Um, there's more you know technology um, kind of driven into it that makes it um, you know more fun to use. Uh, I think just the excitement around it. Um, the different features. So from Dr. Dish, just, you know, in in general, it's just going to be a more user-friendly machine. So we're much, you know, much smaller, easier to move around, easier to set up. So, um, and just more portable in general, about half the weight um, as the other machine. And then yeah, I think just what we've done too is, you know, analytics is kind of a buzzword uh, that you hear a lot in, you know, in the industry. And I think primarily you hear that within in-game analytics. And um, we really wanted to take that kind of to uh, the training level. So, you know, what we've, you know, developed kind of with our, what we call our training management system um, is just being able to track stats from all over the court, um, design specific workouts um, that are much more purposeful, um, you know, through our skill builder program, and then, you know, tie that back into, in, into a game situation. Um, and then I guess that the other thing I'll add to that is just the versatility of the machine. Um, primarily, I mean, everybody kind of used shooting machines under the basket, just get up reps. And now with kind of our Dr. Dish all-star machine and um, uh, what, you, what you're able to do is take the machine away from the basket, put it on the wing, and you're, now you're actually throwing game-like passes where you're going to receive them in a game. Because in, uh, you know, in a game, you typically don't get a ton of passes from directly under the hoop. Um, so with that, that allows you to work on finishing as well. So it's great for post training. Um, you know, just get a post entry pass, do your move, finish, get rebound. Now you're kicking the ball back into the machine um, because the, the net is swiveled around. Um, so it's just an easy kind of an outlet pass and something that just was never, you know, able, you know, to you were able to do in the past. So that's an, another thing that makes it, um, you know, really exciting and then I guess yeah the, the last thing I'll talk about too is just the, the training expertise now and what we've been you know doing with our training management system a lot of you know professionals have kind of seen that in the industry so we're working with trainers like Drew Hanlon from Pure Sweat, uh, DJ Sackman, Jordan Lawley, uh, Joe Abunasar, Pat The Rock so some of these guys are some of the you know top um, level trainers in the industry and they're providing their workouts um, and Know, complete workouts, shooting workouts um, that that you know involve shooting drills, uh, ball handling drills, conditioning drills, all that kind of stuff, and they're kind of infusing that within um, you know our, our training management system, our Doctor Dish app. So now 
you're actually going to go out there and train with a purpose. Because when I used to use shooting machines, certainly, i kind of go out there and I would just kind of shoot around. But there wasn't a whole lot of purpose behind it. There wasn't um, a plan. It was just like, hey, let's just get up 200 shots and call it a workout. Maybe I'll go around the arc a little bit. But they're not in-game type shots. I wasn't, you know, working on, you know, any specific, um, you know, in-game moves necessarily. I was just getting up reps and didn't necessarily translate into a game. So everything we're trying to do here, and, you know, that's kind of why we partnered up with some of these trainers, is we want to make sure that uh, players have the access to the expertise on how to really maximize um, the machine. So um, that, that, you know, I think in a nutshell, um, that's kind of what makes it different, you know, makes us different at Dr. Dish. You know, we're trying to create as much useful and, you know, uh, inspirational, instructional content as possible um, just to help, you know, again, take that training game to the next level and just make it much more than just about reps and just about just, a, you know, a shooting machine and, and really work on building complete players. Yeah, so two things there. One, I know that one of the things that if I'm working with a kid, I like to be able to throw passes, to your point, from somewhere other than underneath the basket. And I know when, when I've been able to use the Dr. Dish machine, that's one of the features that I like about it, is that you can have it set up so that you're catching a pass from a different angle. Because to your point, it is very, very rare as a shooter where you're catching a ball where the pass is coming out directly from underneath the basket to you taking a shot. And again, it's a great way to get up reps, but it's not as game-like. And I think one of the things that has been emphasized in the last five years or so is really the necessity to get up game like shots and that's really how you translate into in-game performance and so what you guys are doing with all the different drills and videos and the skill builder and everything that you have going there I think what's happened is is that you've put a premium on trying to get kids and players to be better players in game it's one thing to be able to you know sit and shoot on the shooting machine and make you know whatever 80 out of 117 footers um, when the ball is coming directly back at you it's another thing to get into a you know get into a cut or come off a screen or you know use a pin down or whatever the case may be and then get the shot off from a game like position and get a pass from a game like spot and I think that's one of the things that you guys are doing very very well with all the content that you're putting out around the machine it's become more than just hey, this is the machine that's on the market, here's what it can do. There's also all these things around it that enable people to see and unlock the real value of what you guys are trying to provide. No doubt. I think you yeah, you hit the nail on the head there. And I think a lot of times it's funny, we get a lot of coaches that say, you know, well, I got a lot of drills, but I don't know how to, I don't have a lot of drills for, you know, the Dr. Dish for, to use on a shooting machine. And really you can use, you know, essentially any drill, um, that you have in the doctor dish is just going to enhance it you know whether it's under the basket whether it's away from the basket you know i think it's it's more so you know not really thinking about you know i have my non-shooting machine drills and my shooting machine drills but i think everything can be you know put into it but it, again it comes back to game like action so I, and we do a lot of clinics and um you know i'm fortunate to, to speak at some of them and try to just give examples of hey here's you know a way that you can use it in you know in practice as you know in a, in a team type drill whether it's drive and kick drive and pitch um you know the hammer action uh the flare action i mean you can use it in so many different ways but uh, one of the main things i say is don't necessarily just take these drills that i'm giving to you and just implement them in your practice but try to hopefully this provides some inspiration on how you can use this in a different way to match your offensive actions and um you know ultimately i think that's that's what you you, you want to just get the players you know the the shots that they're going to get in games i think that's one of the biggest things that i think i really um, you know, missed the boat on when I was, you know, training in high school um, and even in college for that matter. It was, it was, it was always just about the number of reps. And, um, you know, and I could never understand, you know, sometimes where I, you know, I'm shooting 75, 80%, um, you know, in practice. How come, you know, I'm shooting 30% in games? Well, it's probably because it's under a little bit different, con you know, conditions there. So um, that's something, yeah, that we're, we're um, constantly trying to promote. And it's been really fun too. Uh, to see coaches submitting their drills to us, and you know, and there's sometimes where I, you know, I just turn to my team and I say, "Hey, have you seen this? I, I had no idea that you could, you know, really use the Doctor Dish in this way, or I never thought of it that way." But um, that's kind of what's just fun about kind of our community, and I think just the co coaching community, in, you know, in general, is just kind of the sharing of all that knowledge. 
Yeah, it's exploded in the last five years in terms of that. I think that, you know, to your point, when you go back and think about when you were, you know, a high school player or even a college player and you were doing your training on your own and there just wasn't, and I, I know for me, um, you know, I mean, I graduated from college in 1992, so there was no access to any of the things. You know, if I wanted to watch a coaching tape, I had to throw on a, you know, I had to go and to championship production and buy a VHS tape and throw it in there and try, you know, watch the Steve Alford shooting workout or whatever it was. And so, you know, now you can go and you can find quality information in lots of different places. And I think if I was a player today, the way I would train would be completely different than the shooting workout that I would have done, you know, back when I was a player or when you were a player, because there's just so much more information and so much better information. And the other thing that I think you said that's a great point is so many coaches out there today uh, with the advent of the internet, you know, the internet being able to just all of us to be able to have access and have access to video at a high speed and people are willing to share. And I think that's one of the best things about the basketball world is just there's very few things that people want to keep secret and most people are willing to you know if you call up a coach and say hey I want to learn about X or can you tell me about your offense or can you share this I mean most coaches I think at this point are an open book and the fact that guys are you know willing and you know girls are willing to share with you and send in their you know send in their plays and send in things that they're using the, the way they're using your machine uh, that's got to be tremendously gratifying for you guys and just again opens your eyes to the possibilities of things that got to your point you may not have even thought of no, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, yeah. I mean, just even in the past couple of years here, it's 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 been great. I think the the coaching community is it is such a um, you know kind of a unique you know fraternity slash sorority. Um, and I, I you know I know I love going to clinics myself and just you know connecting with coaches there and just um, learning from just yeah a variety of um, you know different you know the speakers there. And I think that yeah that's the general um, you know consensus now is that. And everybody is willing to share, and it's not necessarily that it's it's rocket science that we're we're sharing or that we're putting out on um, you know on social media necessarily. It's just a matter of you know what works for you and your program, your philosophy, and um, and then how well are you are you going to execute it, and how well are you going to um, you know teach it um, to your players and, and and get that across to them. So yeah, it, it's been fun. I think what we're we're doing is um is it is it's just been a blast you know as a basketball guy myself to be able to work in the industry for you know such a kind of a forward-thinking innovative company has has been awesome and just just seeing the you know the names of people and programs that are kind of jumping on board um, with dr dish here you know as, as far as the dukes the north carolinas you know the florida's uh you know miami heat uh, Cleveland Cavaliers actually we were just out in Cleveland um, a, a couple months ago visiting there and, and kind of demoing the machine and um, you know a lot of you know NBA players Mike Conley has one now at his home Zach Levine does as well so it's just been it's been fun you know working with that them kind of seeing the the innovation just the excitement too around I mean a lot of times we just get coaches that are saying this is just it's kind of breathing new life into our program um, and uh, you know we're just we're just you know so excited about the kids are excited about coming into the gym they're texting me you know when can I use the doctor dish so um, that it, it's it's been you know definitely a gratifying um, experience for for me and I think just for our company um, a, as a whole talk a little bit about how individual players can use their smartphone and your app to be able to connect to the machine and and help use that to help them collect data and make themselves a better player and then after you get through talking about that kind of can you talk a little bit about where the company's headed maybe what are some things that you have coming down the road that aren't uh, trade secrets that you don't want to let out of the bag sure sure well yeah the the you know skill builder um, program and you know the doctor dish app is something that we're you know really excited about I mean it was natively built you know within our company and um, you know put a lot of time and effort and hours and a lot of people that are smarter than me that are designing these apps and stuff so um, you know thankfully but they uh, I mean we, we do, we've done a really good job I think so um, first off I mean the doctor dish app it is free for anybody to download and once you once you download it um, it just syncs up Bluetooth with um, you know any doctor dish smart machine out there which is 
you know, our pro and all-star model. So once you sync that up, it, it's, it's really cool. You can actually send workouts. And we have some pre-built workouts, and those are the kind of the, the ones that are pre-built by, um, you know, either in-house from Dr. Dish, or you can choose a pre-built workout from Drew Hanlon from DJ Sackman, one of these guys, and you can literally just go to the workout and say, okay, it's a one dribble pull up um, workout. There's five different drills on here. Um, you know, three of them are shooting drills and three of them are ball handling drills. Um, this is the one I want to do. You just hit start workout and that workout is actually just sent directly to the doctor dish, which is pretty cool. And it, each drill will have a certain goal, whether it's, you know, you have to take 50 shots and then it'll move to the next drill or you have to make 25 shots and then you'll move to the next drill and uh um so yeah through that i mean it's going to track your progress through the entire drill where you're shooting from and it's based on just where the doctor dish passes to so you'll get you know basically a heat map then at the end of it from all 11 locations there's five two point five three point and then free throws um and kind of get the summary there of you know exactly how you did then you can upload that um to the kind of our stats portal or our training management system and this is where coaches can take a look at it um you know obviously players can take a look to kind of track their progress um kind of set goals for themselves compete against their teammates or you know even just users all around the the world too um and so we've seen you know a lot of coaches using using this um just you know I, number one is an accountability um, tool, but also just to see, you know, where players are, you know, are shooting well from. Um, so, I mean, there's two ways really you can use that data is, you know, okay, I know that Jimmy, his hot spot is that left side wing. So let's just make sure that we can try to get him the ball in that, you know, in that area as much as we possibly can, rather than, um, you know, having him on the right side where he's not as hot. But then also, if you're thinking, man, Jimmy is, he's really struggling in that, um, you know, right corner, um, you know, we, we can tell that's kind of a, um, you know, a red spot for him on the heat map. Let's let's design, you know, workouts around that area um, so that we can beef that, you know, beef that up so he can um, be more comfortable shooting from there. So we've heard a lot of success stories around that, um, in, you know, in just tracking that progress. And, you know, we're, we're, you know, constantly making updates. And that's what's kind of cool with our um, smart technology is that all these updates, it's not not like you can, you buy a machine and we update it the next day and you don't get the um, you know you don't get to reap the benefits of that. It's kind of like a smartphone where you just kind of update that software and you're good to go. Um, so it, it's uh, it's definitely been fun. Um, uh, again, just k taking analytics from you know a game standpoint and now kind of infusing that into into training now. So. Tell us a little bit then about what your role is in terms of getting the word out about Dr. Dish as the marketing coordinator. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, definitely wearing a lot of hats. Um, so a lot of the content creation kind of, you know, it, it go, goes through me. I have a tremendous team. Um, you know, probably if you follow, you know, uh, us on social media, uh, which I encourage you to do at Dr. Dish B-Ball uh, on Twitter and, and, and Instagram, especially we're on Facebook as well our YouTube channel, Dr. Dish Basketball. So if you follow us there, you probably see um, a lot of Jefferson Mason, who's kind of the face of Dr. Dish. And he, he's a, you know, he sits right next to me. So we do a lot of content creation between the two of us. And then uh, right across us, we have, um, you know, a tremendous uh, just creative team that, you know, um, shoots the video um, and uh, does a lot of graphic design kind of stuff. So, um, you know, really fortunate to work with all of them. And, you know, a lot of the stuff is just content, you know, based. You know, obviously social media has been huge for us to grow our brand. Um, email is great. So, I mean, I would, you know, highly recommend going on our website, signing up for our newsletter that, that goes out every, every week with new content. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, just traveling, you know, the, the country during clinic season as well, just trying to connect with as many coaches, um, trying to, you know, uh, align with really good partners um, who kind of share the same um, ideals and, you know, ideas as us. Um, and so, I mean, overall, yeah, it's just, it's just trying to build that brand in, in a lot of different ways. So managing the websites and, um, yeah, I mean, it, anything anything marketing related um you know i think the the four of us you know between me and jefferson evan and derek on the creative side you know we have our hands in it the thing that i love about what you guys do is that you have you know a big social media presence and yet what you're putting out there is not just 
sales all the time you know you're, you're putting out their content that even if somebody doesn't own a machine they can put to use and you have whether that's from the videos whether that's just from you know little graphics with uh, you know a saying on them whether that's just um, you know your blog where you're putting out articles that are basketball related and not necessarily basketball related to the doctor just shooting machine but just articles that any <laughs> coach or player could read and gain benefit from and I think that's one of the things that you guys do a really good job of is getting that content out in front of your potential audience and it's not just that everything you send out is a sales pitch there's a lot of great content that anybody would benefit from seeing and reading anybody who's a basketball player or coach is going to enjoy seeing that stuff so as Nick said if you can get out there and uh, you know follow them on Twitter and follow them on Facebook and get signed up for their email newsletter I think that's a tremendous value that you're going to get it's not just going to be a bunch of sales pitches getting sent your way you guys do a great job of, of putting out content yeah no, I really appreciate that and that, that is definitely uh, by design for sure and for for us, it's it's easy because we're we're basketball guys, so we just genuinely you know enjoy creating that and um, you know just sharing kind of our ideals and you know and what we've learned from the game and our experiences. You know, Jefferson actually you know he played professionally for a number of years, so he has a, just a tremendous knowledge of the game. Um, so uh, you know, we we love you know working on that, and then I, again, I mean, nobody wants to be sold to. Uh, especially coaches, and so you know, as much value as we can bring to um, to co coaches to this the game of basketball, I mean, we're we're more than happy to do it, and um, you really develop, you know, and hopefully cultivate some real relationships out there. So it's it, you know, like I said, it's been a fun um, ride so far, and um, you know, any way we can help, you know, coaches, you know, obviously whether it's through our, our equipment, that's great, but even if it is. Um, outside of that, you know, we're going to be more than happy to do that. Anything you see coming down the future for Dr. Dish? Anything that's on the horizon that you can that, share? That you can share that <laughs> might be that might be have for people to look forward to. Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely um, stay on the lookout. There's, you know, there's certainly um, uh, only a certain amount that I can share, but I can tell you, we're we're always innovating, and um, I think we've kind of proven that. Um, you know, time and time again with our product, with uh, you know the different you know uh, initiatives we've done, as far as the skill builder program, as far as you know who we're partnering up with. Um, but we, we definitely have some some cool things coming, and um, that's what's kind of fun about just being uh, you know part of this this company and um, you know the, just the culture of our of our office and our company in general is is, is fantastic and. Um, while we, we love celebrating our successes, we know that, um, you know, we got to get back to work and we got to continue innovating if we want to stay relevant and um, if, if we want, you know, coaches really to, to believe in what we're doing. Last question before we ask you to share out all the contact information again. How much do you consider within your company, how much do you consider yourself a basketball company versus a technology company and how do those two pieces because obviously you have people with a tremendous basketball background like yourself and Jefferson and then in order for all the tech side of it to come together you have to have some people that are great on the technology side so how do you balance out those two things and how well have those two sides within your company meshed together to create you know the environment and the culture of your company yeah that's a tremendous question and um and you know i would probably just split that 50 50 in terms of you know we're, we're definitely um, a basketball company we're definitely a technology company um you know i think the one thing is is we we don't really consider ourselves and we don't want to consider ourselves just a shooting machine company and i think that's kind of the um, just that kind of the status quo out there is, oh, you sell shooting machines. It's like, well, you know, yes, we do, um, but we're, you know, I mean, a lot of our office, and even on the tech side, it's funny, we have, a, you know, at least a few um, engineers that have, you know, certainly a sports background and, um, you know, are huge basketball fans, which I think is rare to find, and I think we're, we kind of hit the jackpot there. But we, uh, we definitely pride ourselves on, you know, hey, we're, what we're going to share is going to be, you know, first class stuff. 
and um, what we are going to create from a technology standpoint is going to be first class too. So again, being able to mesh that together, I mean, it's, it's much easier said than done. And I think uh, you know we're really fortunate though to to have some really great people behind what we're doing. And I think it's, a, it's certainly a credit to our CEO and our founder Doug Campbell has just done a tremendous job of kind of cultivating that, especially through the last few years here. And um, you know, again, more much more to come. Uh, stay stay tuned. Awesome. Yeah. From the outside, it certainly appears that you guys have a good working relationship between the basketball side and the tech side. Because like I said, the things that you guys put out there that are not sales pitches, that are just pure basketball content uh, is just tremendous. So if you would, please share out all that information about how people can follow Dr. Dish, get in touch with you and just learn more about what Dr. Dish basketball has going on. Definitely. Well, definitely, I would say, uh, check out drdishbasketball.com our website there um, you know uh, social media Facebook Twitter Instagram you know at drdishbball um, our YouTube channel um, and then yeah I mean any questions at all relating to you know basketball relating to Dr. Dish um, let me know uh, it's just Nick at drdishbasketball.com um, if you're a coach uh, you're likely on our you know you might be on our email list already and you might be getting emails from me already. Uh, but if you, yeah, feel free to, to send me a note and I'll, I'll be happy to get back to you as soon as possible. That's fantastic. Nick, we can't thank you enough for jumping on the podcast with us tonight. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and learn more about Dr. Dish Basketball and all the exciting things that you have guys have going on right now. And we'll all certainly have our uh, curiosity peaked on what's coming down next in the future. So to everyone out there, Thank you, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Hello, Hoopheads. This is Alan Stein, Jr. My new book, Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best, will be available from all major book retailers on January 8th. Raise Your Game takes a rare peek behind the curtain and shows you what the top coaches and players in the game do during the unseen hours. I share their routines, rituals, and habits, as well as proven strategies that you can implement with your team immediately. If you want to maximize your coaching impact and influence, order your copy today at RaiseYourGameBook.com. And in the spirit of the holidays, if you're interested in purchasing multiple copies for your coaching staff, team, or program, I am offering several bonuses, like a 40% discount, signed copies, and a private video call with your team but you'll have to place your order before Christmas. Once again, go to RaiseYourGameBook.com for everything you need. If you're looking for a great way to spend the holidays playing some basketball, please join us at one of our Head Start Basketball holiday camps on December 27th and 28th, 2018. We'll have a camp at Hoop Guru Courthouse in Hinkley and also at St. Pascal Baylon School in Highland Heights. The Head Start Basketball Holiday Camps will emphasize the fundamentals of basketball with individual attention given to each camper. You'll improve your basketball skills and have a ton of fun at the Head Start Basketball Holiday Camp. To register or get more information, please visit our website, www.headstartbasketball.com. Head Start Basketball's Player Development Academy offers Cleveland area players a unique opportunity to improve their basketball skills. Regardless of a player's age, skill level, or position, training with Head Start Basketball will elevate your game to the next level. Do you want to improve your ball handling, become a better shooter, or develop into a more skilled, confident player? Our academy classes offer training that's designed to do just that. Our training sessions are innovative and will have you learning skills that are transferable to actual games. We have four different class skill levels for boys and girls, ages four and up. All Player Development Academy classes will be held at the Strongsville Recreation Center. For more information or to get registered, please visit www.headstartbasketball.com. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Mm-hmm.